Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're excited that so many of you could join us today for on decolonizing therapy. I'm Jason MacArthur, the events coordinator for the Public Programs Department of the California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Jennifer and Bianca, and then we'll get right to the conversation. Bianca Loriano is an award-winning educator, curriculum writer, and sexologist. She is a founding member of the Women of Color Sexual Health Network and Ante Up, a virtual freedom school offering professional development, training, and certification. She wrote the Sexual and Reproductive Justice Discussion Guide for the NYC Department of Health published in 2018 and is leading the curriculum development for the Netflix film Crip Camp, which is rooted in disability justice principles. She is an ASEC certified sexuality educator and supervisor, and in May 2020 was awarded an honorary doctorate from the California Institute of Integral Studies for her work in expanding the US sexuality field. Jennifer Mullen creates spaces for people and organizations to heal. She believes that it is essential to create dialogue on how mental health is deeply affected by systemic inequities and the trauma of oppression, particularly the well being of queer, indigenous, black, and brown people of color. Dr. Mullen earned her doctorate in clinical psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies. She is currently a full time psychologist at New Jersey City University's Counseling Center and facilitator for the campus. LGBTQIA plus support group. In 2019, she founded Decolonizing Therapy LLC, which seeks to create spaces to, to call mental health professionals in rather than call people out. Dr. Mullen believes it is essential to ask mental health professionals to reassess their education and begin to question the relatability of the mental health industrial complex to the people they serve. It is her belief that we can tend to our emotional and mental health and hold systemic oppression accountable. And now, let me turn it over to Bianca and Jennifer. Thanks so much. Hi, Jennifer. I'm so, so honored and excited to talk to you. We've been behind the scenes getting together, um, but I'm really Likewise. just so grateful that you're here. Um, so we're just gonna hop right into it, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an opportunity to share a little bit more um, from what was shared about your bio. So I'm gonna just throw several questions at you. You get to choose yeah. which one you wanna answer. Um, like, who are you? Who are your people? Where do you join us from? What's the story of your name? And mm. who might show up in a cameo today that we can be prepared <laughs> for? I love it. Well, I'm gonna answer the last one first because it's my favorite. <laughs> so um, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer, as you've heard. And um, I would say that you're gonna probably get a cameo from my amazing goddess, Kat Isis. Um, she has been making little cameos. She's really interested in some of the equipment. So um, for all you cat lovers or fuzzy animals out there, don't be surprised. That's, so that's one. <laughs> um, the other is I'm coming out of Hudson County, New Jersey. Um, so we are, so hoot hoot, yeah. <laughs> so um, representing Jersey City in the house. Um, we are right across from the New York area. Um, so I was, I've had the privilege to grow up with like New York City, Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx as my, um, playground as a teenager and a youth. I will say, I'll leave that there. I'll, I'll just say that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so I'm just gonna hop right into it because I know people are really interested in what you have to share yeah. and your path towards healing that you're really identifying in like a decolonial framework. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things um, that I always think about as someone who is Puerto Rican, whose homeland is still a colony mm -hmm. of the United States, I'd love for you to share with us um, your thoughts about how you're defining the term decolonize when you use it. I've yeah. seen so many people use it as like a buzzword without giving it a good context or definition. And I think people are using it without understanding if there's a shared definition. So I'd love to hear yours. Yeah. Together. Yeah. Well, as I have to say, like as someone who comes out of, uh, well, my people, let me, let me, let me bring a little bit of the last question into this one. Um, part of my experience has been of feeling constantly othered. With that, I will, I will say right off the bat that I have a great a deal of privilege. So I can locate and identify myself as a cisgendered woman. I locate myself as a light-skinned um, Black Panamanian woman. Um, I locate myself also being mixed heritage and there's privilege in that. Um, I have 
much proximity to whiteness in many, many ways. Um, and, you know, definitely having a doctorate also adds to that, <laughs> right? But, but what doesn't add to it are the invisible disabilities, are the ways that I identify as um, on the queer fluid uh, spectrum or kaleidoscope, as we like to say, um, the ways in which um, I definitely am othered and treated and seen as a woman of color, depending on where I am, I'm definitely racialized, yeah? Um, so nine times out of 10, I'm walking into spaces clearly feeling the difference, right? I, I, I don't know about you, but I can feel the room. I can feel, oh, yeah. <laughs> not virtually always, <laughs> but I can definitely, when walking into spaces, um, when people are feeling intimidated just because I have a serious face on, or um, if I do decide to speak out what comes up and what comes around, but my first experiences as a very little kid, 14, 15, 16 years old, going to Panama, um, and so that's where my mother is from and that's where my family is from. And there was so much anti-Blackness, although there's so much Blackness in my family, right? Um, so we are of all different shades and colors. And because of my ancestry and my family coming over, well, actually not coming over, but being kidnapped and forcibly enslaved and um, being made to create the Panama Canal, many of my ancestors, as well as the other half indigenous Kuna Indian. Uh -huh. So I was thrusted into this rite of passage at a very awkward age of like 12 or 13 years old. And um, part of that experience, A, was super uncomfortable for me because I was so Americanized, uh -huh. right? And I had such a privilege of this like American perspective, even though we grew up at the poverty level. Mm -hmm. um, but there was also this energy and this experience of being drawn into the things that I couldn't explain, mm -hmm. being drawn into the areas, the places and the spaces in which um, I wasn't allowed to talk about at home, right? Mm -hmm. What I was seeing or, or, you know, hey, wait, is that great grandma or who's this? Or that looks like the person in the picture. And I was having all these experiences and it was only when I was able to slowly thread together some of my own indigenous ancestry mm -hmm. and then for years grapple with whether or not I have a right to claim it, you know, it, it, like this, this, this struggle. That is when I think I was able to see clearly or a little bit clearer because <laughs> I'm still not clear. Let me just say that. I don't know if we ever are. Um, yeah. Just the ways in which colonization has also taken over Central America, over the islands, over every single, almost every country throughout the world. So for me, colonization has been an act of extraction an act of taking language, customs, belief systems, land without a doubt, but even people <laughs> um, and, and the ways in which we engage with one another, um, taking away a humanity, a dehumanizing of a people, of a place and of a land. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of my work you know, working in inner cities within Newark or Oakland. Uh, I had work down in, um, you know, up actually, because I'm thinking of where y'all are, like Vacaville and mm -hmm. <laughs> California. You know, is this realization that the mental health system was continuing, continuously colluding, right, mm -hmm. with this larger systemic beast mm -hmm. with so much violence. Um, so for me, the decolonization process um, is about extraction and it is about the extraction of um, taking out the whiteness and the Eurocentricity from situations, places, and, situ and belief systems. Uh -huh. um, I would also dare say that my definition of decolonization is very much about giving back land, right? Yeah. right? I work with a lot of organizations. I am also a community organizer. So a lot of the places and spaces and accountability spaces that I have involve um, the indigenous peoples of the land. So although I'm a settler in New Jersey, yeah, <laughs> definitely, mm -hmm. but also some of my people were forcibly brought to New Jersey uh -huh. without, <laughs> or brought to the US or brought to the South uh -huh. without our consent. So I think that it's a complicated dance. Mm -hmm. um, what I believe decolonization is not is a buzzword. Mm -hmm. I believe it is not a, another word for social justice. I don't believe that it's another word for us just simply um, wanting to do better, although I appreciate the sentiment. Yeah. Um, I really think it's about a returning to our mm -hmm. ancestral ways mm -hmm. while keeping in mind with the future, mm -hmm. right? Because we, 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 there was no Instagram back when we were right. younger either. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. Yeah. We did not grow up with the internet. It's so true. And, you know, I hear you also saying that there is a reclamation of our humanity that you're really um, centering and trying to shift from the way that we've been trained to dehumanize each other and the way that we've been socialized to do that implicitly or very uh, specifically, depending on, you know, how we grew up and how we were raised. And I think, you know, I see it in my own family as well. We have a lot of similarities and overlaps. And I also think a lot about, you know, how chattel slavery shifted a lot of how we understand yes. um, capitalism today and just yeah. dehumanization in a whole other level. And, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate you bringing in like your Panamanian um, heritage because you know, when I show people like a time lapse of kidnapped Africans who come across the Atlantic, they're not landing in the United States primarily. You know, they're really showing up in Brazil yes. and parts of Central South America and the Caribbean. Yeah, Cuba, and that's something, Puerto Rico. yeah, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's, and, and then to hear that our families are really, you know, buying into this assimilationist whiteness ideology of like, you know, not claiming our ancestors who like fought hard for us to be here. Um, mm. You know, I really, I really, that's, you're singing my song, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> and so I'm wondering, you know, through your therapeutic training and work, how have you seen colonization show up specifically in therapy practices or even in, in trainings? Um, and what does it mean to decolonize therapy to you? Yeah. Um, you know, to be completely honest, I, with my knowledge, right, with the education, with, I feel like I have received an amazing amount of education from like community organizers. Mm -hmm. I have received education from people's floors that I, you know, they're sleeping yeah. on floors and I'm like, wait, what? I'm watching my privilege sort of like, ah, yeah. <laughs> I can't do this, man. you know, checking myself. And, and what I want to say before I forget is that I want to also honor every single teacher I've had along with every ancestor that I've had. So I would be remiss. So I'm throwing that in there because as I'm speaking, I'm also hearing them. I'm also hearing their teachings. Mm -hmm. I'm also hearing um, the beautiful conversations I've had with people that I've served that have allowed me to work with them as a therapist, as a psychologist. And I also want to honor for any of the therapists out there thinking after I'm gonna say what I say, <laughs> how am I gonna do this? Or how does yeah. this work? This is too big, this is too much. Mm -hmm. That we have to start somewhere mm -hmm. and we have to do better once we start evolving and becoming conscious. I believe that I also engaged in harm mm -hmm. without my realization mm -hmm. prior to really having an analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think that we all start somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. my starting somewhere was attending too many black and brown youth's funerals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my somewhere was um, really having a difficult time following plan and doing CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and, you know, trying to be psychodynamic and look back at, at dreams and systems and the ways that I was taught. And I appreciate the ways that I were taught, what I was taught. Mm -hmm. However, it wasn't putting food on the table. It wasn't addressing the neoliberalism in higher education. Yeah. It wasn't addressing the ways in which imperialism and colonization had spread all over the world. And when I speak of colonization, I need to also say it's global for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I do honor Turtle Island and what has happened in North America, but you know, Philippines and the level of colonization and forced migration and forced contractualization that has occurred. Or if we look at Australia and the Aboriginal population, we could keep going. So mm -hmm. um, I also want to say that decolonizing is the psychological and emotional embodiment mm -hmm. of reclamation. And so that's what decolonizing therapy in many ways is for me. It's a sort of um, midwifery into ancestral healing. It's a return to ancestral healing mm -hmm. while at the same time holding these institutions of Eurocentricity accountable. And so mm -hmm. I love being a therapist. I love being a psychologist and I love kind of stepping into my power and being able to like serve people. Mm -hmm. What I didn't appreciate was not hearing about Dr. Frederick Hankling out of Jamaica who's been talking about decolonizing mental health. And I only found out after he passed on and became an ancestor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I only, I was only hearing about Dr. Joy de Gruyere when I was digging into my dissertation on intergenerational trauma. So the names, the identities, the theories are predominantly um, Caucasian, cisgendered, um, of an older age bracket, um, and are generally out of touch with the people that I was serving and definitely out of touch with me.
Mm -hmm. Um, And where I see colonization show up in a lot of the um, one-on-one work or the group work, because group is my primary modality in the work that I do, um, is in disconnect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so like, I think that colonization is about, is the origin of disconnect and mm-hmm. that trauma creates this energy uh, of the historical trauma that many of us have dealt with, as well as the intergenerational trauma and the complex trauma that people are dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this forges this psycho-spiritual connection, to be perfectly honest mm-hmm. with you, Bianca. I feel like colonization has created this deep grief, this deep disconnect with self and with other, and that a lot of what is happening now for many of our generations is a reconnection, like a plugging back in. And it's like a coming back online rather than a sense of um, survival. I know my mom and dad and grandparents were not thinking about like, oh wait, what is decolonization? (laughs) How have I been colonized? (laughs) Like, how does this affect me? And so Mm -hmm. in many ways, I feel like this work is about the emotional stewardship, right? When Mm -hmm. we talk about decolonization, we are talking about getting right with the land. Mm -hmm. But when I'm sitting with my elders and I'm sitting in certain circles and in some of our shaman practices, I know that some of the abuelas and the curanderas, when they're talking about decolonization, we're also talking about the energy, the spirit, um, this psycho-spiritual way of knowing the way that we heal and take care and hold space for each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Although the the land is there, I'm not minimizing the land aspect, (laughs) but I also want to say that a lot of the elders are also holding decolonization from another lands as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, I believe that before we can give back the land, many of us um, whose land that we do not belong on per se, right? There, there is a process of undoing and an analysis that needs to be had, a sort of politicizing. And I believe mm-hmm. that that's where decolonizing therapy sort of comes in, in this intersection between uh, the collective, the personal, the spiritual, uh, the political and the therapeutic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I totally hear what you mean by people saying, Jennifer, that's so much. Oh, my God, you just named like 16 different things. And it's like, yeah, we're complicated, messy human beings. You know, We're not just like <laughs> this easy cut and dry, like that's it. One one solution is going to find the answer. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate that uh, framing because it's so important for people to not only hear, but also to witness what that can look like in action. And, you know, I think sometimes people just get really caught up on the language and kind of forget the, the action piece, right? And so I say this a lot to, you know, the students that I support and who are writing. I'm like, you just need to stop reading and just start writing. You yes. know, stop thinking there's more books that you, know, that you need to read. Mm-hmm. There's probably more things you need to listen to, not just read. And so, you know, helping people reframe the, the multiple ways of knowing that we're able to bring in when we are open to them. I think that's a yeah. really important piece that challenges a lot of the ways that we're trained where the written word is like exalted, yeah. you know? And I, I know that just from like our, the fact that we both went to NYU, the school, <laughs> the school of education, <laughs> that we, you know, we're affiliated with CIIS. So like, I know this in many particular ways and also I think that's why people are attracted to your work so much is because you do have an interdisciplinary approach mm-hmm. where you're not just staying siloed in a Western understanding of psychology, of psychotherapy, of psychoanalysis, whatever psycho thing you want to talk about, but that you're really saying, no, we need to learn from the oral narratives. We mm-hmm. need to learn from listening with our whole bodies. We need to learn from sitting in, you know, on the dirt. We need to really also come inward. And that's not... Mm-hmm a bad thing. And I think a lot of times people misunderstand the going inward piece. Because like, no, we need you here. And it's like, that's also about self-preservation is also what I hear you saying, which is deeply for me about decolonization. It's like, how do we preserve ourselves to do this work, to show up in the ways that we want to, to be able to hear a calling on and a correcting when it needs to occur, um, and then how to correct that behavior moving forward. And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, or a lot about, the challenges <laughs> to incorporating a decolonial framework. And you know what, what's your response to those individuals or communities who are still experiencing or still stuck in that very co- colonial ideology of 
life <laughs> of living, of being, and how to move into a more decolonial space. And I think, you know, I offer this question because there might be people listening now or in the future who are really going to be like, oh, that's what I needed to hear. Um, so I would love to hear you say. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the reframe. And I think, you know, our land is, was not the only thing that was stolen. Mm -hmm. um, and so f in the process, emotionally and psychologically, I think that many of us start out at a very <laughs> disconnected place. Like the very nature of um, white bodied supremacy is disconnected. Um, the very nature of it, I think is um, trying to pass and assimilate and to fit in and to push down our difficult emotions and to try to swallow back what needs to come out. Um, and so, I, I know I keep talking about disconnect and embodiment. It's because I've only recently realized that part of what decolonizing therapy is offering is the absence of a frame <laughs> mm -hmm. and the initiation into embodiment. Um, so I say this to say that many of the folks that I work with, whether in groups, and organizations, one-on-one, um, -on -one, um, a lot of times there's this coming to of like, well, what if I don't know my ancestors or what if, you know, I didn't know my grandmother's name or what if I can't trace A, B, C and B, D mm -hmm. back. And the first thing I would say is, well, we need to take some breaths. <laughs> yeah. And number two, we also need to look at patterns, right? We need to look at behavior because people are trying to understand oneself. In mm -hmm. trying to understand oneself, we can't just look at the self as psychology would prefer. Mm -hmm. It's really essential to also go back what happened in my people's history? What happened on this land that I'm on? What has caused a disconnect between me and my mother tongue? Mm -hmm. um, what is home? And where can I initiate a sense of home in my body, mm -hmm. in my relationships, in the field that I'm working for and the people that I'm serving? And so I would say that part of this work is truly deconstructing the colonizer within. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, and that is where I, I talk a lot about like emotional decolonization and that's where I reside. It's like, mm -hmm. what are the ways that we have been conditioned to believe that um, lighter skin is more attractive, um, that a smaller body is more attractive? What are the ways that we have conditioned to believe that someone, that the binaries need to exist? I know I'm preaching to the choir with you, <laughs> Dr. Loriano. <laughs> but, but seriously, you know, and sometimes, I, I mean, I talk about all of it you know, the two spirit identity, the ways in which um, the grandmother energy needs to come through the earth, the collective pain, because so many therapists out there have only been trained in, in class work, right, in theory, but what about in energetic boundaries? Mm -hmm. What about in emotional regulation of ourselves? What, in, uh, what about us being a depository for the pain? for the mm -hmm. suffering, <laughs> for the container of other people's sorrows and intergenerational trauma. And so what is the impact of that on us, mm -hmm. right? What is the impact of that? And not just on therapists, on everybody. Like, so if you're holding space um, and you're a rape crisis um, hotline worker, or mm -hmm. you're one of the warm line workers for NAMI, or you're a nurse, or you're a beautician, and yeah. people are sharing everything with you, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I talk to my, the person who cuts my hair all the time, and I'm like, wait, I need to say this to my therapist because I don't know if I've told her this yet. And yes. I just had a revelation, right? <laughs> yes. Shout out yes. to my, my hair um, But yeah, you know, all of this to say that we we all start somewhere. And yeah. so I think that looking at that shame, like we were given these difficult emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Like rage or defensiveness, uh, this, this overwhelming feeling that I've seen many people step into. I've even stepped into it in various points throughout my life, yeah. right? For different identities and different reasons. And so yeah. we can step into that defensiveness and take those breaths and step yeah. away and say, okay, where do I have to do more learning? Mm -hmm. What have I learned that needs to be unlearned? where have I, you know, where did this theory derive from, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Who's teaching me this theory? Mm -hmm. um, what is the context? How does this land with me? And then if you do spiritual work or ancestral work, then how does that land with my team? How does that right. land with my ancestors? How does that land with yeah. my folks, right? Yeah. And so for me, it was always, and again, I, I talk about myself and say me to humanize myself because I think sometimes with the doctor, people forget 
that this is also a very personal process. Mm -hmm. And so in creating decolonizing therapy, it was, it was created with community. This isn't a Dr. Jennifer Mullen thing. This yeah. belongs to the people for the people. And mm -hmm. the hope is that it's not just therapy that we're decolonizing, but that we're lovingly holding the mental health industrial complex accountable mm -hmm. for the ways that it teaches, treats its, you know, therapist, mm -hmm. for the ways that it treats its people or it doesn't treat them. Yeah. And the ways in which we have been um, lied to about how we have to do this work. Mm -hmm. So um, questioning everything, empathy, compassion, yeah. looking at the shame that we may be feeling, as well as um, being in collective. You'll hear me say this a lot throughout the next mm -hmm. hour, <laughs> yeah. um, that it is essential to be held and mm -hmm. also hold space for others. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of my favorite disability justice principles is interdependence. Mm -hmm. And everything you just said is deeply in alignment with that, where we need each other to do this. We need each other to thrive, to survive. Mm -hmm. We can't do it alone. And I think you demonstrating like how you document your the evolution of your knowledge, the evolution of your practice, how you come to a space where you're like, it wasn't, I didn't just get here by myself. <laughs> it was by questioning, you know, the Freud that I was forced to read and asking why, why don't we read some Fanon or whatever it looks like, right? Like mashing it up in a different way and also questioning that canon that we're told is the right thing to do, Absolutely. which many of us know is like not even the tip that many of us are trying to get into, you know, like it's, it's, it's not even accessible at the time. Um, and I also hear you talking about embracing the chaos when you begin to do this work, but also the chaos that's always going to be present. Yeah. And I know like as an educator, I usually tell people I would much prefer a chaotic classroom than one that is super quiet mm -hmm. and people aren't engaged. Um, because that to me is life. That to me is like, yeah. you know, livelihood and energy, just like you're talking mm -hmm. about. And it's also like uncertainty, which is also a part of life. Like we're not always going to be certain if like our offering to our ancestors is going to be acknowledged or held or, you know, responded to in a particular way. But yeah. also like that's, that's, the, that's the risk, I mm -hmm. think, that comes with choosing ourselves, that there's consequences to being on the side of choosing ourselves. Yes. Um, and some of those consequences are liberation and interdependence. It's not always violence, although it may be. Um, and so I really appreciate you mentioning that and reminding us that like binaries are a scam <laughs> because they are. Because they are. <laughs> I mean, there's no way around that. And, you know, and bringing in this conversation that you're, that you're introducing us to around rage and anger, I really love because, you know, I remember reading Black Feminist Thought by Patricia Hill Collins, where she says, anger and rage is our space from which we can learn, grow, mm -hmm. and create action from. And so I would love for you to talk a little bit more about how you're channeling those those energies, those emotions, that knowledge in our body minds um, into a decolonial framework that you're offering in a therapeutic way. Yeah. Um, well, I believe that when we really start to understand our history and our trauma um, and our people's history and trauma, even if we're not exactly sure from which island, from which place, from which space that we came from, there's a lot of emotion, a really tough emotion that starts to bubble up to the surface. And um, it has been my personal as well as professional experience um, and spiritual experience to consistently be face to face with um, the darkness, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it, I think it's really essential for many of us to acknowledge the ways in which we have harmed others, right? On personal levels, as well as ancestral levels. And so I say this to say, that part of this, and again, a paradigm, I, I hate to call it a frame because yeah. it, it feels like it's the antithesis of, of, of decolonization. So that's why we're still struggling with yeah. this, like the language, there is no language for it. But mm -hmm. this paradigm is to really start to look at the shadow the collective shadow, to look at the shadow of the self. Um, and that isn't a slightly Jungian way for those of you that are therapists out there. <laughs> Shout out to Carl Jung, who was at least attempting to look at identity and race and multicultural issues, dream work, the anima and the animus. And so part of what really started to come in in this work on our retreats when I was working with uh, at the university 
where here we have like first generation college students, undocumented college students. Here we have like inner city folks from the hood, hood that I grew up in, meditating, you know, talking about their family history, screaming into a mirror, you know, vomiting after group because they're literally expelling all the pain and the fear and the overwhelm. So I'm a practitioner first, you know, shout out to this ID program. <laughs> so as a <laughs> practitioner, what came up for me, because I always cared about the people, right? My people, yeah. I was all about elevating my people, um, whoever they were, but it was those at the margins, right? Relegated to the margins. And in DT and decolonizing therapy, what started happening was this beautiful marriage between that which nobody wants, right? That which collectively, you know, as, as a society that we don't want to ingest. And um, in this process, it is essential to look at the things that our parents have gone through, that our grandparents have gone through, even if we don't know exactly. It's essential to also look at, as I've said before, the history of the land that we're on. And so when we're unpacking this, when we're becoming more radicalized, when we're realizing how everything is absolutely political, right, everything is political, there comes this moment, I believe for many of us, of deep either grief or rage. And I believe that they're two sides of the same coin. Um, I think that for someone like me, I grew up, uh, it was easier to feel rage and it was protective. Mm -hmm. It was a disguise that I needed in order to survive. For mm -hmm. others, I think that depression becomes a dark lover, you know, mm -hmm. or that, that anxiety or, the, or that deep grief, like sitting in that because that feels safer. Mm -hmm. So I say that to say, because we're complex as humans. Yeah, it's, it's never, again, the binary, it's yeah. never like you're one or the other, <laughs> yeah. but, but the flip side of them is where the freedom and the liberation is, in my mm -hmm. humble opinion. And so um, I like to define rage as the love child of shame and ancestral trauma, mm -hmm. um, as well as our childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at it in that vein, we see that there's a very big ancestral component. A lot of us, when we do have these rage outbursts, and that doesn't always mean we're flipping something over or slamming something. I also need to say that rage has disguises like depression, yeah. like distraction, like devotion, right? There's yeah. there's lots of disguises to rage and, and it is different than anger, right? Mm -hmm. Where anger is more of a justified one-stop thing. Like someone mm -hmm. cut me off, I'm pissed, I'm yeah. in rage. Yeah. Whereas rage, there is a sacred ancestral connection. And so, mm -hmm the crux, I think the foundation actually of decolonizing therapy mm -hmm. is looking at the historical ancestral trauma mm -hmm. and remembering what was. And I, part of that work is also holding psychology, social work mm -hmm. and counseling accountable mm -hmm. for the harm that we have done to people mm -hmm. um, throughout the last couple hundred years or so. Yeah. yeah, and I also hear you talking about like the power that comes with being in this position mm -hmm. and how that's complicated. You know, we started off talking about like, we know what power looks and feels like, even if we can't taste it or see it or touch it, we know that it's there. And that's part of like our, um, our inherent, you know, <laughs> knowledge that we are often socialized to, to not listen to. And, um, and so I really appreciate you bringing that conversation about power without even saying it, <laughs> because that's really how I translate it. Because I'm like, oh yeah, Jennifer's really mentioning this idea of power and even like intersectionality, you know, talking about like, how did we get here? What is the historical elements that brought us here? Because that's, that's how we may understand what are some possible solutions? How can we get more creative? What does it look like moving forward? And so listening to you talk a, a lot more about like the ancestral healing, through ritual and ceremony and resistance. I'm wondering, um, you know, if you're open to talking a little bit or if you even discuss or consider hauntings, like what haunts mm -hmm. us? Um, mm -hmm. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Does that also manifest as rage that's righteous? But also, mm -hmm. you know, what what is your stance or what, what are your thoughts about how we may be haunted by certain things, whether they be good, bad, neutral, something in the middle? Yeah, um, what a beautiful question, yeah. Um, I, I believe that if we're talking, of, I believe that, let's talk about United States of America and yeah. North America and South America. So the Americas, right? Mm -hmm. I believe we are deeply haunted as a collective. Um, so I should have noted, and I don't know if I did prior, um, that they're like the two branches of decolonizing therapy. And part of that is the individual 
and what happens to me and how that is permeated and affected in the rest of the world and how the world is also affecting me as well as the collective. Um, and having that pulse on what is happening to everybody. So in answering your question, yeah, I mean, I believe that we're dealing with the underbelly of, of our ancestors' actions, right? I think that we're dealing with the repercussions of that. And in many ways, we are haunted by um, the lack of acknowledgement, right, of many of our ancestors, of um, the enslaved Africans that were brought over, of the Chinese that built the railroads, of the indigenous people that have lost um, their land and given reservations, right? I'm mm -hmm. always fascinated by words, right? Like we have yeah. reservations, what does that mean? Um, and I think that part of the haunting piece where we can land is in finding home, whatever that is for us with a capital H, you know, coming mm -hmm. back to a centered place of self where we can feel less disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's um, Topoka Turner that talks about, I, I love her book, Belonging, um, speaks about that loneliness is not just about a, uh, not having someone around or like a disconnect, but a not being able to speak to, you know, the truth of what you feel deeply, like not having others speaking your language. And so for me, I think also the haunting <laughs> aspect is also deeply related to this um, shadow self, this yeah. this collective shadow that many of us mm -hmm. don't want to look at, which is why we focus a lot on emotion. Yeah. You know, I think that there are so many theories out there that are beautifully put, but if the people can't ingest them and understand them, and I work on this all the time myself, then what mm -hmm. good is it? Yeah. Right. And so a lot of times what happens, I know for myself as well, as someone who is trained as an academic, is that I'm still unlearning. Right? Yeah. I'm still unpacking and unlearning the ways in which I need to drop from here mm -hmm. to here, to the body. Like how has, how can I embody this? So I would say that the haunting is like the trauma, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it yeah. is a deep traumatic reaction to people's mind, bodies, and spirits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, when you said the haunting in the academic way that we've been trained, I felt that deeply through and through because it's so true. And you know, I like to think, and people have told me this, so I like to continue to think it, that one of my superpowers, if I'm even going to acknowledge those um, and claim that term for myself, is taking really complicated ideas and theories mm -hmm. and making them more accessible mm -hmm. to community members, to people. And, you know, I've trained people who are like, Bianca, kids don't understand intersectionality. Yes, they it's do. It's such a hard theory. <laughs> right. And I'm like, um, you have to make it relevant to their life. Yeah. Yes. So go talk to them about... Yeah school uniforms they understand power they understand institutional power they understand oppression yeah. you know you just got to make it relevant to them and you know thinking about these hauntings i think also you know for me being introduced to those hauntings was definitely deeply rooted in like a sociological imagination and what that could look like in a sociological way and thinking about what is still haunting me in our field what is still haunting me as someone who's unlearning the harmful ways that I was taught to dehumanize other people and how am I showing up for that work? And, you know, you talked a lot about interdependence and your community holding you. And I would love to hear a little bit more about how do you find support for when you may experience failure or when you may mess up or cause harm? Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about either personally or professionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do you have an accountability process that you incorporate in your personal and professional life. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that how are we doing this work without accountability? I think that it's essential. It's more than just like write pretty words or <laughs> prose or poetry. Yeah. Um, we're talking about um, the process of actually excavating the framework <laughs> of systems or you know, taking part in the excavation of systems that continue to harm people at and below the poverty level and uh, they're melanated. So, um, I continue to be held accountable by my organizing communities. Um, I would say that I have two strong ones. Um, I continue to be held accountable um, by my spiritual community um, and by my spiritual elders as well. Um, I have elders in both political spaces as well as spiritual ones. And I think where the growth process has to continue to happen in my own life is finding those places and spaces where they're political and spiritual mm -hmm. and that the analysis um, that we can speak each other's language, 
Mm -hmm. right? Because I, I'm very much for international solidarity. I'm very much about like beyond Turtle Island, you know, although it's very important to me, but I also care about what is happening overseas. And, and mm -hmm. I'm conscious of how this affects everything else in our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so also holding myself accountable for um, ecocide and looking at the ways in which environmental racism plays out and what's our carbon footprint, so to speak. And mm -hmm. these are things that I would just like, Okay, well, this is really important. And, and, and some of my friends had to like check me <laughs> and re-remind yeah. me. So I would say yeah. that the process of accountability is often first, um, so like an inner circle, right? I, mm -hmm. I feel safest bringing it first to my inner circle, but not an inner mm -hmm. circle that is just like my best friend is going to tell me everything that I want to hear. Yeah. I think it's about acknowledging where harm has been done. Um, having the education or the re-education on what needs to be learned and what are the steps towards learning it. Um, really looking restoratively, do I have to sit down and look and talk to someone else, apologize? Do we need a mediator? What would that mm -hmm. look like? Who is the best person for that? So in two or three of my circles, we have systems in place. I don't feel at liberty to like discuss them in detail, but yeah. I will say that it is very close to like restorative justice work yeah. um, because there has been egregious harm done and there are times where we also all can acknowledge that it is best not to let people go. I'm not for mm -hmm. this term cancel culture kind of gives me mm -hmm. the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's just it's interesting <laughs> well, yeah. we'll have that. and if we have time I'll get to it. I, yeah. I just think it's it's you know people have to take accountability and is that really canceling when we have mm -hmm. to show accountability? Um, so that, that I can get more into that later if we need yeah. to, but um, accountability must be taken. And, and I think that it's important to also work through the emotional content. So that's something that we have in our process for accountability is also looking at the ways in which we have to feel it physically, mm -hmm. that there needs to be space and time, that perhaps accountability may never be taken. Perhaps an apology will not ever be given. Right. Perhaps the relationship can never be repaired, or perhaps one or two of us need to step down from various positions and can no longer engage in that way anymore mm -hmm. because of the harm that we have enacted or because we need time. I think that time also has been colonized. Right. Yeah? And I think that we're often rushed and pushed to feel a certain way, engage a certain way, act a certain way, uh, to, to hurry up and like apologize because both people want closure. And I don't think, I, I'm quite certain as a psychologist that closure does not happen in a week. Closure doesn't happen often in a month or sometimes even in a year. So what does that look like for us to really embody um, self accountability as well as community accountability, accountability and self forgiveness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I often tell my students like, guilt is a useless emotion and it's not don't get me wrong not when someone has really um done a lot of harm but in the sense of where we're constantly like i feel guilty about this i feel guilty about this mm -hmm. i feel guilty about it okay so what now mm -hmm. what next what right. needs to happen in order for us to either rectify this for you rectify this mm -hmm. for the community how can we begin to call other maybe communities in in our pods mm -hmm. Um, and actually ask for a little bit of what we call like respirator support. Like yeah. we need somebody to come in and really breathe life into the situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important that the people holding space have multiple lenses mm -hmm. and have multiple intersecting points of identity that reflect the people or the peoples that are struggling. Um, so this is, yeah, I, I have been in, um, I would say more recently in my life, they have been about me holding space for others. Yeah. And I would say that more recently, it has been much more about um, being an active listener and an mm -hmm. active conscious sort of recipient of what mm -hmm. people need and, and giving them that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have to say that, um, you know, I think having a social media presence, there's this, I feel this like, anxiety of like, are you going to be canceled? Are you gonna be called out? Have you done yeah. something? Have you this, have you that? And I kind of, not that I don't care anymore. I just, yeah. <laughs> I, just I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah. I, I care about what I'm saying. If I'm mm -hmm. harming somebody, I care about serving communities. I care about this work, having integrity and authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I care about making sure that it's understood and not just used as a buzzword and, mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's, been a, there's yeah. been a lot of that. There's a lot of that, but I don't 
care to sit in a place where I don't speak my truth because then that would recreate the trauma of a lot of my ancestors as well and not mm -hmm. speaking out and not having the ability to speak on what we need and what our people need. Yeah. I hope I, I answered your question. Absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot about how many of us have been socialized to fear conflict and to fear messing up and failure. And, you know, I've told a lot of the people that I support and mentor that like, this is a human experience. It is human yeah. to fail. Yeah. It yeah. is human to mess up. It is human to learn and unlearn. Yeah. And those are, you know, that's also like brain chemistry stuff, right? Like, how do we respond to that? What does it feel like in our bodies? How is our brain sending us messages? And, and how how is our body mind reminding things that maybe other parts of us might not remember in similar ways? And so I think um, you know, being clear and open and honest with people and saying, yeah, I have an accountability process. Yeah, I got a grievance policy for when I do this stuff. And that is really an amazing modeling for people to understand that we're not just doing this off the fly, you know, that we've put in time and energy. I mean, you've done the work, you did it the Western way, you did it your way, you did it the way of your community. And this is what is possible is an example of one, acknowledging that maybe harm has occurred, but also that failure is happening and not dehumanizing yourself because you've been radically loved and gently corrected or not so gently corrected. And, you know, I have a lot, uh, I too, I'm like this language of cancel culture is a misappropriation of what <laughs> is really happening and what it was yeah. originally created for. Yeah. And that I think is important to acknowledge because language access is also so, so important. And we touched on that briefly with, you know, making concepts more accessible. Yeah. If they're, if they're like high theory, but it's the same thing um, here with like accountability. And, um, and it is, it's like you say, it is such a spiritual, visceral um, welcoming <laughs> of this because that's how we do better. And that's how we, how we build collect collectively and collaboratively mm -hmm. and, and how we let people show up and love us. And I think those are the pieces that, you know, oftentimes I think people are afraid of this radical love <laughs> that's showing up. Um, it's of being, being human. Yeah. Sorry it to really cut you is. off. Yeah. No, it's true. <laughs> it was a conversation. It's terrifying. Can you talk a little bit more about like that fear that yeah. you see bubbling up for some people and also how you support people to move within it and not around it? Yeah, um, it, it's right. It's, it sounds cheesy. The way out is always through, but it 9.5 out of time. That's how it is. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that most often what people come in with, right, are usually relationship issues, mm -hmm. right? Like even with an organized, like I, I've majority of people that I serve are organizers, like hardcore frontline organizers, mm -hmm. um, underground organizer. And a lot of what happens is like, yeah, but I was misunderstood here or I didn't step into my power here. And mm -hmm. I did, and, and it leads to beautiful, beautiful places and spaces when done gently and correctly, right? And when held with this very conscious politicized frame, we can start to, I like to like, like oven mitts, right? Like kind of just gently, sorry, this doesn't want to stay in. Um, <laughs> kind of just like gently, like lifting a person up and like gently energetically holding while they're sitting with this place and space of, I'm afraid to be seen. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to speak up or this isn't, I'm being misunderstood or there has been some sort of harm done. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I'm lost. And yeah. with this lost feeling, in my humble opinion, often comes this sense of wanting to be known and seen, fully seen, right? With a capital mm -hmm. S, fully like whatever space that we're occupying, this sense of, I just kind of want to be, I want to be seen here. I want to mm -hmm. be located here. And I think that part of this process for many people, um, again, with the disconnect, does relate back to colonization. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not making this up. I mean, I mean, literally, I mean, part of what colonization has done, and, and I don't want it to be a symptom checklist, right? Which right. is the issue, right. but it has formed this sort of cerebral, metaphorical, as well as physical disconnect between a person and their possible community, their possible places of being loved. It's allowing oneself to fully be seen in all of that messiness. Right. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be seen in messiness. We want to be seen as 
good. Ugh, I hate yeah. that word, right? What is good <laughs> or bad anyway? F uh, the yeah, binaries, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, with this goodness, I enjoy helping people pull back the layers to look at, well, what if you're not good? Okay, we're going to mm-hmm. use that word good. We'll use the word good if you want to use mm-hmm. that one. What would it look like to be messy, Bianca? I'm just using yeah. it, right? Like, what would it be like to not show up with a full face of makeup if that's mm-hmm. what some people talk, right? What would it look mm-hmm. like to talk about your white identity, your part white identity? What would it look like not to always say the right thing or to not right. always be super prepared or not to always know or to be exhausted? What would it be like mm-hmm. to rest without rationale, reasoning, or anything to do. And I think that we know that capitalism and the way that the structures are set up create this inability to rest. And so oftentimes the education then goes back to, well, you're blaming yourself, but what about this nine to five? Mm -hmm. What about, and I start to, to lead individuals, right? Sort of like on a canoe, through um, a process of looking at systems in a very tangible, understandable way, um, mm-hmm. looking at how all of these systems are interacting in a nexus to work together mm-hmm. um, and to feed each other and to continue to feed the top one to 2% of the population. Yeah. Um, we have conversations about this and how it affects their grandmother's needs mm-hmm. on how it affects their father's asthma, right? Like mm-hmm. again, with the humanizing and the highlighting of how these systems continue to eat at mm-hmm. us. So mm-hmm. I, I would say, although we started out talking about like, you know, being seen and love, but it's the same yeah. thing. Like how yeah. can you fully allow yourself to step into love and be seen when we're still very much operating from a system that is telling us we're only worth our labor or our degrees right. or what we can carry on our back. So mm-hmm. for me, they're always deeply intertwined. And I think it's mm-hmm. always beautiful, you know, to take out, I enjoy taking out, well, I used to, but now virtually, <laughs> but, you know, taking out a big piece of paper and creating this like trauma timeline, prepping, yeah. you know, a person I'm working with in advance, but looking at the ways that individually, as well as culturally, and ancestrally that we have been violated, Mm -hmm. you know, and then looking at the ways of, well, maybe that's why I'm having a difficult time trusting now. Maybe that's why I'm having a really difficult time being present here in this space or being in this class or what have you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Or like speaking up or finding the courage to like demand that I'm treated better or whatever else shows up. And I think it really, it definitely, for me, hearing you speak definitely connects to the conversation we had about grief where there is my experience you know grieving like the death of my first relationship on the planet my mother and how that like nobody could have told me what that was going to feel like it really like just shook me at my core and also people have really high expectations for people who are grieving mm-hmm. and it's wild to me <laughs> when it happens and um and i see it still occurring as people are grieving and mourning during the covid pandemic and, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about what it looks like for the people who are wanting to show up for the grieving person or for the mourning process or ritual? Because I think my experience has been that some people think that grief is contagious and mm-hmm. so they'll run away and they don't want to be near it. But also some people are just stunned. They don't know what to do. And so what are some of the ways that you could share with people who want to support those who are grieving or fine or, or mourning um what are ways that can help people show up and like challenge this idea that grief is contagious and it's not it's not really a human experience um mm-hmm. yeah yeah what are your thoughts about yeah that? thank you yeah um ask mm-hmm. yeah like i i honestly the number one thing that I feel like I've been saying, like a little parrot, because there's been so much death and loss, right? Yeah. And and so many people that are coming in, like my mom is dying, my this is happening, this is happening. My own family members, I've had two people pass away in the last month and a half. Like it, it's a constant, a constant. I feel like grief has been pervasive, particularly particularly for Black body people, mm-hmm. right? Like I mean, I think it's just <sighs> it's heavy. It's everywhere, and so asking, you know, mm-hmm. asking, what do you need? And I know that those of us in our circle, we know what that means, but mm-hmm. it's not like, what can I do? Um, when's the last time you ate? You know, how's your sleep doing? Um, mm-hmm. Hey, do you need me to wash your clothes for you? Or let me come by. Can I come yeah. by for a few minutes? I think that there's a misconception that folks that are grieving 
want to be like left alone. I, I mean, there is this dichotomy of occasionally feeling like there's moments of coming back into oneself and then this space of suddenly, oh, that just reminded me of blank said person, you know, or this color, this smell, this scent, this Chanel number five that someone's wearing <laughs> is very, is reminding me of my abuelita and like, right. whoa, tears, right? Yeah. Like, how do I, oh, and then as a friend, I think, or as, as a partner, as a, as a, you know, co-parent, as, you know, another person, another human, I think it's important to pay attention, Mm -hmm. You know, to notice that it's past a week or even past a month that a person will still be grieving, mm -hmm. to check in even months later, you know, to hold space for that, to understand if they ask, do you want to come to my birthday celebration? Sometimes mm -hmm. holidays, birthdays really can be very triggering for individuals that are in the grieving process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and another thing is, I think just like encouraging movement. Um, I know with one of my closest friends that have just recently lost their mother suddenly um, and unexpectedly, maybe a couple months ago, I make it my business. And this might sound ridiculous, but you know, we have busy lives. Yeah. So I literally put it in my calendar, like every few days or every week, depending, not to be too annoying, mm -hmm. but just like, yeah. Bruh, love you. You know, I'm thinking yeah. of you, right? Or sending random pictures of us or, oh, when's the last time you've gone outside? Let's do our walk. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't really feel like moving. Okay, well, I'm going to come by and then I'm going to come upstairs and da, 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 da. you know, just yeah. also making sure that I'm not speaking or any of us are speaking in these patronizing tones, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, this is really hard, like when appropriate, but sometimes yeah. folks just don't want to be treated as though they have this like grief letter on them rather than right. a scarlet letter, <laughs> right, right. right? Like, like just, just a sense of, Hey, I'm here. Um, asking if they want to stay over more, you know, even if they're not children. And I would say for the children and the youth, particularly grieving during this time, really paying attention to their play, mm -hmm. right? Play is one of the ways that children connect. And I think it's really essential, not just for us adults, we need play as well, but youth, children, teenagers need play. And that is the way that some of that trauma is processed very organically. And so okay. play therapy is shout out to all my play therapists. Like it is, it is the MVP and yeah. adults need to play therapy as well. <laughs> my oh, humble yeah. opinion. So mm -hmm. I would say like, you know, get on the floor with kids. Like even, oh, they're fine. They're okay. We're not seeing anything, but yeah. then we're the ones that see years later after a loss or after yeah. a massive um, world event that mm -hmm. maybe there's a lot of bedwetting or maybe mm -hmm. there's a lot of aggressive behavior and we'll ask what has happened in the last few years oh, nothing you know a couple of years ago their grandfather passed away and they were close to them but mm -hmm. they were fine right after so mm -hmm. I think it's also educating ourselves that grief is not linear the same way yeah. sexuality and gender is not right now <laughs> that yeah. is not it is not linear it's not mm -hmm. just like okay I'm mourning depressive now I'm feeling happy or feeling better. Oh, now I'm forgetting. No, it is this twirl. It is this figure eight. It is, is consistently contracting and expanding. Um, and when in doubt, ask, yeah. ask, right? Because I, I do feel that it is personal. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and using language to connect to each other. You know, and that's something that I usually tell people a lot about as well is like, when my mom, who died of Alzheimer's, um, the term Latinx was really becoming popular. I would have never said that term to my mama. She wouldn't remember that. Like, So I'm going to use language that's going to bring us closer together and not yeah. pull us further apart. Yeah. And I think sometimes it is as simple as like asking or inquiring. And I really love the examples that you offered us because I too do those things. You know, I have the date of my uh, friend's mother's death day in my calendar and and other important moments like that um and also like i was one of the first people in my friends who lost a parent a lot of my other friends had lost a parent when they were teenagers and they were like you know 15 20 years um mm -hmm. from that and they just had a completely different experience mm -hmm. and um and yeah it's a constant shape shifter and it's also a really human like this is the circle of life, you know, like, like death change. We know that those are some of the guarantees. Yeah. Um, and so before we go into audience questions, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what is your vision or hope for the future of therapeutic practices that are embracing a decolonial praxis? Yeah, um, my hope and vision and what I'm starting to see opened up or that um, therapists, social workers, people that are practicing um, clinicians 
really begin to do their own investigative work first. Mm -hmm. So um, hence what I believe I specialize in, right? Is helping people get to the root of their emotion and investigate and get curious about it. So I'm hoping that we're seeing this huge push to not just be overwhelmed and inundated with cases and managed care, but rather, and, and we're starting to see a shift really personalizing. We, we don't have to be a blank slate <laughs> and people get to decide who they want to work with as well, mm-hmm. right? Like folks have that agency and they have that ability to make the decision to say, yeah, I don't really kind of like her politics around yeah. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Not right, that we right. want to share everything, but you know, we, we, it's, it, it's, it's a reciprocal process as we give and take and, you know, mm-hmm. we give support and receive support. So I'd like to see the humanization of therapist. Number one, mm-hmm. number two, um, I believe that it is also moving towards this shift in moving away from such a strong medical model. Although I want to say that there are places, spaces, cases, reasons, and rationale why having a diagnosis can be really helpful. Mm-hmm. However, <laughs> yeah. I have seen few and far between. Um, managed care is a beast and a system within itself. So I think that we're going to see more healing in mental health and therapy as opposed to treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, and as opposed to this very strict pathologizing of intense, normal human emotion and the range of human emotion, mm-hmm. I think that we are going to see um, again, with a, a reclamation, because part of decoloni- decolonizing work is not just the re-educations and the questioning, mm-hmm. um, but also the reclamation of what was. So we're not talking, I'm not speaking of appropriation at yeah. all in any way, shape or form, yeah. but actually people coming back into their own ancestral ways. Like, mm-hmm. like my white identified folks out there, right? Like prior to becoming white, right? There you were... Irish, Italian, Czechoslovakian. So it's like, there it is again. <laughs> the reclamate, also the reclamation of your druid ways and and, and, and healing methods and methodologies, right? Mm-hmm. Pagans, Wiccans, right? So so the belief that this deep ancestral healing can only come from people of color, I believe is erroneous and very mm. short-sighted, right? I, I do think that there are multiple ways of knowing and understanding but it first has to require a lot of internal digging Mm -hmm. and understanding of the ways in which privilege shows up. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're going to see a lot more use of indigenous ways of knowing, our Mm -hmm. own indigenous ways of knowing. I think that we are going to take also an approach of really being first line responders much more. I think that Mm -hmm. this pandemic and the pandemic and the violence on black lives, we have continued to see this massive shift and movement towards the importance of mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, And not just when there's a problem, but all the time. And so I think some of us have been thriving in it, (laughs) particularly folks of color that have also been therapists were like, yeah, we, we like, yeah. This is what we've been doing. We've been trying to take care of ourselves because systemic disease took us apart, right? Yeah. <laughs> These systems took us apart. And here we are bringing ourselves back together again mm-hmm. every every Friday, like Humpty Dumpty. Right. So I think that we're also going to see this shift towards um, less of a police state, especially when it comes to social workers. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of removing children from families, deciding who gets to be where. So I'd like to see, and we're starting to see, Um, social work, counseling, psychiatry, psychology come together and also hold the boards accountable, Mm -hmm. right? And looking at the ways in which many of us have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt. Yeah, if we did not have funding from families and did Mm -hmm. not have that privilege. Mm -hmm. Um, And so holding these systems and these boards accountable for getting to decide who gets a license when we've already had this amount, a much amount of coursework, who gets to decide to do this, who can practice in New Jersey when you only have a license in Indiana, Mm -hmm. right? Who can, it's simply another way to gain more money Mm -hmm. and to run us ragged. So I think that there's going to be a reckoning (laughs) of the various boards. Um, And I think it has to start internally first. Mm -hmm. Um, Mental health professionals across the board have to ask, you know, why are there babies in the water, right? Like, why are our kids dying? Why Mm -hmm. are we not well? Why are the mental health rates so high? But if we're so burned out, 
and we're so pushed to the limit with capitalism fatigue and compassion fatigue, then how can we ever stop to look down the river and be like, oh, the, there's systems at play here. This mm -hmm. isn't an individual's problem. They're yeah. not just depressed because you know, uh, they broke up with someone. They're also depressed because they're working this many jobs. It's impacted their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, their mother is undocumented. They're worried about A, B, C, and D. So I think that this will be the norm and there will be new systems, new schools um, or of unlearning, I would like to call mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just want to invite um, our audience to just revel in Jennifer's, you know, vision for our future. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's stunning. It's holistic and human. Um, and I just want to conjure it with you. And, uh, you know, with that, I want to welcome in a couple of questions from our audience. Mm -hmm. And if you're with us live, you can share a question through the form that you can find on the screen somewhere underneath the image, probably. Um, but this first question comes to us from Anna. And Anna asks, how does one navigate the colonized and limiting boundaries of the DSM-4? or five in therapeutic practices. To be licensed and provide care means complying with the guidelines set by colonized institutions. Okay. Yeah, so um, thank you, Bianca. So, and thank you, Anna, for the question. Um, I honestly believe that it's near impossible to navigate, right? The, to, to be really, per, really honest with you, I think that it's really near impossible to navigate um, the DSM-4 and practice in a politicized frame, in a radicalized frame. Because um, I think it's important for us to understand, I just want to say this, Anna, um, and to everybody else out there, that you know, there's a politic politicization, I can never say that word, right, process, like we have to have a little bit of a analysis and understand our own identities and the people that we're working with to then get into some of the nitty gritty of our histories, right, and then go a little bit deeper to the decolonization process and mm -hmm. um, being part of this movement of, of helping to return the land back to its rightful stewards. So, the DSM, it does the antithesis of that, yeah. Um, so I'm not saying that it can't be useful when it comes to understanding various symptoms of depression or bipolar disorder type two or um, so on and so forth, but they're also very stigmatizing. The I don't believe that it should have ever been constructed in the first place in a way that focuses on this group of symptoms, yeah, and then creates this sort of treatment just for these group of symptoms. It does not, I believe, allow us to really step into the humanity of a person. Um, so I believe that there was a second part of the question as well. I wanna mm -hmm. make sure that I get that. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, yeah, I put in yeah. the chat box so that you can see it too. Thank that, you so much. Do, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah. you. You're the best. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and the reality is, right, as we know, we don't fit within those boxes. Of course, our clients don't fit within those boxes. And that's where I get excited. Question mm -hmm. asker, Anna, <laughs> and everyone else. I get really excited when I think about us weaving together, right? our ancestry, our past with our future, right? There's a futurism to what we're doing. I think a lot of us are sitting in this unknown of what is going to happen next in all of our respective fields. I think people are starting to realize, wait, I could do my job from home. Mm -hmm. I can do this even better. I can have my cat on my lap. I can, like, <laughs> yeah. right? I can have a snack yeah. and, my, and my juice box. And we're starting to also realize that we haven't been taken care of. I think mm -hmm. anxiety is through the roof. Mm -hmm. Right it, through the roof, yeah. you know. Uh, people are talking about sleep problems all the time. I believe because the the haunting, right? As you we were talking about, right, Bianca, like it, it it's bubbling, it's bubbling up. The collective unconscious, that underbelly, that unshadow, it is coming up of who we haven't acknowledged, what we haven't seen, what questions we're not asking, who is not in the room and at the table. Mm -hmm. So. It is a reckoning of sorts. And I believe what is starting to happen is that therapists, mental health workers, we're realizing we're feeling a little bit of the pressure. I'm hearing yeah. this a lot. Like, yeah. wait, I think that we're gonna be asked to speak out more. I think we're gonna be asked to do more. I think we're gonna be asked to be in various business places, spaces more. And so I just wanna, I just wanna acknowledge 
a little bit of the anxiety that we may be feeling mm -hmm. from what we hold yeah. therapists out there, as well as the impending shift of what we must also create and mm -hmm. be responsible for creating. And that means that we may not have the master's rule book and we have to create our own mm -hmm. together. Yeah. yeah, and it's also a good reminder around the power that comes with being someone who has to abide by these guidelines. Mm -hmm. And what are the strategies that you take when you acknowledge that like, oh, if I give someone a diagnosis, it may follow them for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. And that has a really longitudinal effect on people. And so here's another reframing of like power that I love the way that you talk about. Um, another audience question that we have is from Mel. And Mel asks, greetings and thank you for this discussion. Could you speak to how using art and creativity can possibly support therapists in decolonizing their practice? Mm -hmm. We need you, art therapists, trauma therapists, <laughs> somatic therapists, like, right, because we're talking about embodiment, right? We're also talking about the need to really not always have words or language, as we were talking about before, mm -hmm. to describe what the body is experiencing and allowing the art to take over. Um, I have to say that crayons, markers are a thing in majority of my sessions, um, even yeah. if they are virtual. And I also have to say that my people know that like construction paper, journaling, super, super necessary. So we can get to some of the gook, right? The mm -hmm. stuff or the symptomology, if that's what you want to say, yeah. <laughs> that continues to kind of eat away and erode at the human spirit and at the human psyche. Um, I would also say that some of the beauty of the art therapy is that we don't need to speak the same language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we don't need to color within the box and the lines. And it can be a beautiful sort of like tabula rasa, right? Like this blank yeah. slate, literally allowing a person to have a little bit more agency um, with their body and their feelings. Because I know at the beginning of my journey, when people would say like, well, what is your body saying? Or listen to your body. I, I only recently, and I'm in my 40s, have, have been able to tell the people that I'm working with, like, what does that mean? When you've had mm -hmm. such an intense history of trauma in your body, what what does that look like? Literally, like what does being in your body look like? But mm -hmm. when I'm drawing or if I'm dancing to my 90s old school hip hop or I'm, you know, whatever I'm doing that allows me to feel embodied, um, repotting one of my plans, if mm -hmm. I am coloring, right, that allows me to get out of this cerebral frontal low place and overthinking and allows me to drop in. And I can also do that in community. Yeah. I can also do that with others. I'm, you know, I don't know if anyone else that is a Zumba fan out there, but I really miss my Zumba classes. A dancing helped me embody mm -hmm. uh, so much. So mm -hmm. I would say even virtually we can do that. We can find these little modes of connection to be embodied and artistic and creative together. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and again, we have two more questions that I want to get to. We probably have time for a few more. So if you're watching live, you're welcome to submit more questions for Dr. Jennifer Mullen. And so here's another question. What are specific things we can look out for colonized therapy and how can we think of it uh, and engage with the therapy methods in a more decolonized way? Examples are super helpful for me to understand how colonization shows up. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Yeah, so some of the things we can look at are timing, right? Um, I know many of us work on an hourly system where we see a, a person, a client, right, for 45 minutes to 50 minutes maximum. So that's one of the things to look at. Um, if somebody is 10 or 15 minutes late, do we still allow them into our office? Particularly if you work into in an institution of education, right? Um, are you on your forms? You know, are you giving options for identity? That's another way, right, to, to look at it. Are yeah. we, um, when we're having our case conferencing, and again, I, I'm really big on language, so that's why I keep doing the air quotes, because yeah. it's like case conferencing. Have we ever considered inviting in the people that we're serving? Have we ever considered asking them what's coming up for them? Or what diagnosis, if you need to give one for insurance purposes, would they prefer? to have on the form. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's important that we have an interdisciplinary way of healing, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it sort of doesn't go together, but it, but it does. And have we considered referring people out to holistic healers? Some of us might have, especially shout out to the Bay Area, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> but 
some of us may not. And, and I can say as somebody who was partially trained in the New York area, it it's, can be super, super, not always, but very traditional and very sort of, there's a lot of Karen Horney, a lot of object relational work and it's beautiful, but there's sort of rules. And so I would say to those of us caught up in some of these framings and these rules, whose rules are these and do they work? for the people that I'm serving. So I'm just giving you small examples, some other mm -hmm. examples of ways that we can politicize our practices more are to you know, speak and involve some of the acupuncturists or people doing Reiki with your client, like inviting them into the case scenarios, not just honoring the words of psychiatrist or psychologist, right? Or somebody with an LCSW after their name, but also taking into account the list experiences. Um, another thing I often do, especially I did when I was at the university, is allow for our family systems mm -hmm. if the person feels like it's helpful to mm -hmm. also come into certain sessions, right? Like it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a couple session or a family therapy session, but you know, there are a lot of students that would say like, I don't have the words or they weren't talking and they would mm -hmm. sit there and shake the whole time and say like, I wanna be here, I promise. Yeah. And I had many loving colleagues um, and I wrapped them in compassion because right, we know better and we do it differently. Yeah. But there were many colleagues that would say like, okay, then I would just sit there in silence for the 45 to 50 minutes. And I'm giving mm -hmm. you an example of something that I've been taught to do, mm -hmm. right? Like we're not gonna do the work for people mm -hmm. and that's true, but we also wanna make it accessible and mm -hmm. trauma doesn't allow our work to be accessible sometimes, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> trauma yeah. is part of looking at ableism, right? And so if we look at it in that frame of thought, I think it's really important to look at the ways that we continue to police our clients mm -hmm. because they're not fitting into a frame of the kind of client that they think they should be and the yeah. kind of anxiety that that causes for them. Mm -hmm. um, and above all else, I think that we have to start learning and looking at systemic dis-ease, right? Looking at the ways in which, you know, some of the people that we're serving are working two and three jobs just to make the living wage, right? Yeah. Just to survive, just to be here, rather than asking them to shave their head or you know cut their dreadlocks or right yeah. right or or do something that's going to make them more applicable or check their resume for them if, if anything we should be checking our own bias and the ways that we have been conditioned to do the work so mm -hmm. i could keep going on this is all grouped in sections and um you know, I think I'm at liberty to say that, you know, a book is coming, <laughs> you know, I'm working on it this, you know, this year and it'll be out by 2022. And part of the work will be asking us as clinicians not to get stuck in the how to, mm -hmm. but in the interaction of how can we, right? right. What do you need? What mm -hmm. would this look like for you if, mm -hmm. um, and incorporating more of what we know a person is deeply needing and at the core of it all it's connection mm -hmm. and more of a humanity from us mm -hmm. rather than just this sort of neutral blank slate mm -hmm. yeah and that's definitely exactly what goes against how many people have been trained so i really like that you're introducing that for folks we have another audience question that says how does one connect to their ancestral roots if they are unaware of their exact roots how can we support clients to connect with themselves and their quote unquote people when they don't know? Yeah, um, I think that's such an important question. So thank you for asking it. Um, well, number one, um, I think it's important to look at our intuition, to look at our how we connect in general. Like, is there a connection with source or spirit? Are you a spiritualist? Are you a Buddhist? Are, you know, how do you identify? Are you completely you know, agnostic or atheist? It's just mm -hmm. cool as well, right? So I have two clients that are atheist identified, but they still do ancestral work. So I just wanna, mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, and so I would say that part of that is to go within with a guide, right? To go through that journey and to figure out um, land and space. You know, some people do know a general region. Some individuals may have an idea of, okay, well, I was told that my father was from Honduras, right? I don't know anything about my mother, but we still have ancestors, right? Even if we don't know them. 
right? So mm-hmm. I, although I've never met my great, 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 great grandmother, it, it really doesn't matter whether she was from Italy, Panama, whether she was from Dominican Republic, the reality is I can still connect with her spirit. I can still connect maybe with some of her ways. I can connect with some of the roots of the people as well. Um, So I would say that it does take a little bit of sitting with self. I think that um, shamanic work, if that is your path and that is part of your people's path. And if you're not sure, again, there are people out there that can sit with you and do this work with you to help you unearth. Um, I think it's a difficult question to answer generally, to be honest with you, because we're all so unique. And so it would depend on whether um, someone went through an adoption process. Do they have any information about their family? Do they have a little bit of information about their family? All of that matters, as well as, right, like how we walk in this world, how are we racialized, Mm -hmm. right? So that that can give us a little bit of of a connection too. And what I mean by that is there are a lot, a lot of students that I've worked with that would say like, well, I'm black, but I'm not African right? Like this disconnect with the continent, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that disconnect has been created by lots of, I'm not going to get into mm-hmm. that. I'm going to stick yeah. to the question, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I get really <laughs> excited and passionate. Sorry. I'm not sorry, but you know, yeah. uh, so uh, what we sometimes do is like start looking at, okay, well, well how did you think that your people came here? Um, and oftentimes people, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But then a week later, Dr. Jen, you'll never guess. I had this dream and such and such and such happened. Tell me a little bit more about that dream. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, on this dream, I felt like I was drowning in the middle of the ocean. There were all these people and often they're not as clear as that. But Mm -hmm. many, many, many people have dreams that are intertwining with past lives or parallel lifetimes. Um, And those could be kind of peaks, right? Behind the curtain. So I don't think that there's a perfect answer to that. And, Mm -hmm. and I'm still learning and I'm still understanding into that question. I Mm -hmm. I ask it often, but I will say in those cases, we really have to go into our intuition, allow Mm -hmm. ourselves to journey and allow ourselves to honor what feels like home with a capital H. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. We have another question. Um, and it is, how do we integrate a decolonized framework and a non-carceral approach towards mental health hospitalization? Is that possible? It is possible. It's absolutely possible. Um, but what it would require is the dismantling of the hospital, you know, the, the, the healthcare industrial complex, the way that it is now Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the way that the mental health. And when I say industrial complex, I just mean that it is a system, just to put it lightly, it is a system that continues to benefit from poor people, sick people, unwell people, so on and so forth. And I'm minimizing it, but just to answer the question, um, so mental health, healthcare, right? And even the prison system, are all in bed together. And in the ways that they're in bed together, they also um, help each other financially. Um, They're probably each other's friends and golf buddies. (laughs) We could keep going on in the ways that they overlap, (laughs) but they also funnel money and and people through these systems, right? Mm -hmm. And people unfortunately equate in many of these systems, dollar signs, Mm -hmm. as we know, right? And so many of us, would not have jobs if it wasn't for poor people, mm-hmm. right? We, we, we thrive, unfortunately, even if we don't think so, we are gatekeepers for these systems um, just sucking from our poor. And so in that way, I feel like it's important, again, to understand like a little baby bit of like the politicized aspect behind it, because I think it's important to realize that mental health hospitalization is carceral, right? Mm-hmm. It is violent. And there are ways. Um, I have sat in many spaces, indigenous circles and many other places, spaces not just in the, on this land where you know it has been kind of graphed out who would be taking care of said person going through this experience for these days of the week. What do they need? Do they need a safe room? What kind of things shouldn't be in the room? So it's sort of allowing the community to take care of that person, but also then allowing the people taking care to be taken care of as well. So Mm -hmm. maybe they can't go to work on those days. Maybe they can't do their tasks in the village on those days. Mm -hmm. So then how will they be eating? How will they be fed? Who will Mm -hmm. take care of them? So in these ways, we want to, again, think back and look 
what were our ancestors doing? Like what was happening back then? How right. did we hold space? Um, what did the, you know, the curandera, the healer, the shaman, you know, the witch doctor, like what are the ways that they stepped forward and had just as much, if not more cred than a psychiatrist, <laughs> right? right? And, and yeah. more and more healing, right? Yeah. And more healing in many ways. Um, and so I would say that it is possible, but in my humble opinion, as of right now, we're a ways off from that. And um, I think that in many of our lifetimes, we would be doing the work to have more humane spaces. Because I also want to acknowledge that sometimes people are a danger to themselves or others. And we know that there is a deep trauma response, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's nonverbal, even if it's, it's pierced for personality. Yeah, personality disorders. Um, but it's a trauma response, nevertheless. Mm -hmm. Historical, intergenerational, and current. All right. I call it a hamburger. <laughs> it's like all in one, and it is killing us. Yeah, and yeah. so sometimes people do need to be placed in a safe place for a period of time. Mm -hmm. But I believe that they also get a right in that as soon as they're able to be back in their bodies and mm -hmm. in their spirits. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's a work in progress. Yeah, and I think it's really important to also acknowledge that like the... Um, the work that disabled people are doing to end institutionalization is deeply in alignment with abolitionist work. So thank you for bringing those two together as well. Um, so here's a question that's been asked multiple times. And uh, the question is, what are resources um, for therapists who are learning about how to decolonize our therapeutic practices? And can you recommend any foundational readings, your favorite readings, or pieces from important thought leaders that are specific to this arena? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, part of what I can say is that there has not yet been this like one-stop resource where mm -hmm. all of this information is. Um, I believe, and I'm not saying this in an egoic way, I believe mm -hmm. in terms of decolonizing therapy, I have been one of the first people that have really been putting some of this language to it. Our people have been doing this for eons. I just want to say that, right? Like our communities right. have been taking this approach and some of what I'm talking about, um, you know, it's, it's, socialists have been talking about for years, right? Like, like this isn't brand new, but I'm saying yeah. in this frame, I think is the question, right? In this, mm -hmm. in this pocket. So it's being worked on. Yes, there's tons of articles. Mm -hmm. I always say to start with decolonization, decolonization is not a metaphor by mm -hmm. Tuck and Yang, because I think it's important for all of us to understand the roots of colonization and it is a big word it's a mouthful and it can turn people off let's keep it 100 right yeah. like so i i get that and i also have children being able to identify what decolonization is this is why right, right like the like where children can talk about like what inter intersectionality is right mm -hmm. and kindergarten children understand what privilege is right if right. i give all of you a sticker and i don't give you a sticker right with no rationale yeah Right? So in that way, I think that we need to give ourselves credit. So I would say that decolonization is not a metaphor. It's one of my favorites, but I also highly recommend. And again, this is, I have synthesized a lot of all of their work for the people for the gram, for my mm -hmm. blogs, for the work that I do for this book, yeah. because it's been my life's work and my own personal internal journey. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to get into it, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire is an essential. Um, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGru Leary, essential, one of my absolute person heroes. Yeah. Um, Anything by Dr. Maria Braveheart Yellow Horse um, really was like one of my first introductions to historical trauma and historical grief back in like 2009 when I was doing my dissertation at CIIS. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to Tanya Wilkinson, who is my chair and was like, you deserve this doctorate you need this and your people need this. So I had to say that, I had to shout Tanya out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I also have to say that the work of Ruth King's Healing Rage has been essential in rage work and also a newer book by Lama Rod Owens, um, Love and Rage has been really beautiful to understand difficult emotions. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm trying, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. Yeah. Like, There's so many. <laughs> There's so many. My bookshelves are like all around me. Right. Um, and I would say another quick one would also be um, Care Work mm -hmm. by Leah. Oh my gosh. Leah Lakshmi. Pipes. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I believe that we need, in order to really start this politicization process and, and, and really this radical liberation in this way, this 
undoing, this unlearning, this re-educating, we have to be interdisciplinary. I cannot say that psychology has given me everything I have needed to be yeah. in this work. I'm a lover of my field, but I'm a critical lover of my field on how we can do better and do more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and I'd love to add to that um, the work of Audre Lorde, especially the uses of the erotic as being a different way to imagine pleasure in our bodies and our experiences. I also love organizations that do collective work. So the Fireweed Collective offers, for those of you who have clients that may need sliding scale or pay what you can group support um, experiences virtually, they have a variety of them um, run by community trained individuals. So I encourage people to check them out. And then if you have clients who are, um, you know, healing from childhood sexual abuse, I think Mira Memoirs does a really great job. There is Aisha Shahid Simmons, um, whose book Love with Accountability is really great and beautiful. Um, and it is like an interdisciplinary approach that we must engage with to really have a more broad understanding of what's being produced. Um, so I thank you so, so much. This has been such a joy. I know people are going to come back to this and rewatch it again and again um, in the future. And we're excited for your book in the future as well. And I'm here to conjure with you all the things that we want to have for our whole selves to be here. So thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer Mullen. It was great thank to you. be with thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bianca, for being such an amazing steward of this conversation. I appreciate you and thank you for the tech team and everyone else on the ground. We appreciate you. Thank you. So we're going to head back to Jason to close us out. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. If you'd like to watch it again or share it with the community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at the same link and on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and good night. Thank you.